Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you for coming to think about a question that has changed my life completely. I'll tell you why in a few moments, but I've got um, a little bit of time to talk to you about two things. First of all, what is the resurrection? What is the claim here? Why is it important? Did it happen? And then the question, what does it mean? What, what, what does that actually change? What effect does that um, potentially have on us, every single one of us, as a human being? Now, many of you will know, and some of you um, will be awakening to the idea that Christian faith is much more than just a building or a collection of empty buildings with dusty pews and old ladies um, singing songs in the dark to themselves. Christian faith is actually a living faith. Um, it's a faith that comprises all sorts of beliefs about what we um, see in the world and how we see each other. But at its heart, it's about a living, loving friendship with Jesus. And Christians really genuinely believe, as mad and crazy as it might sound, Christians actually believe that they have a friendship with Jesus who um, is God and who was a person in history 2,000 years ago and who was put to death on a Roman cross and then rose from the dead and then came back to give life and hope and truth and rescue to his followers and those who would trust in him. And so the, the key claim here is that the, right at the root of Christian faith, this is not a, a peripheral issue to Christian faith. What we're talking about today, the question of the resurrection, whether it's a hoax, whether it's history, what its importance is, this is the most important question at the center of Christianity. It really, really matters in that sense. I'm going to talk through then these two different stages. Did it happen? And I'm going to talk about faith, facts, and fit. I'll explain what they mean in a moment, and then I'll talk through in the second stage. Well, what does this mean? What's the impact of this? I sometimes feel that people ask the question, what does it mean, before they ask, is it true? And as a philosopher and somebody who's interested in evidence and reason and logic, I want to be rigorous in my thinking, and whether or not something works for me, it's more important to me than whether or not it, it's more important that something's true than whether or not it works for me and makes me happy. I hope you um, agree in some of that as well. So what do I mean by faith, facts, and fit? First of all, I want to talk about faith very briefly. From the very earliest times, the understanding of faith is very different from the contemporary understanding of faith that we have in the world now. In the world now, in our contemporary society, if you ask people outside walking down the high street, what is faith? They would probably say something along the lines of, well, it's something you can't be sure of. It's something that doesn't relate to facts and evidence. It's something that's non-evidential. It's something that isn't, doesn't have a rational basis. You just have it or you don't have it. Good for you if you have it and it makes you happy. I don't. I'm walking on my way, maybe. Well, from the very earliest times, the view of faith was totally different from our contemporary view. The earliest view of faith is found in a letter between some of the early churches. It's found in many places in the Bible, but it's found very um, concisely in this letter to the early church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In verse 13, Paul, an apostle, writes to the early church, if there is no resurrection from the dead, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Well, I've read um, French existentialist literature that's more happy than that sentiment if it's actually not true. It's a very serious claim. He is, in effect, making the whole of the Christian faith and all of its different parts and tributaries a hostage to the historical event of that resurrection. Did it happen? Did it not happen? And you will find in the booklets on the table in front of you, in Luke's gospel, that's a free gift for you to take away today as you're exploring your questions. If you open up that book into the um, first couple of pages where there's a big letter one that says chapter one, if you look at verses one through to verse four of chapter one, it says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were the first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. And therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also for me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. In other words, the gospel writers were themselves trying to persuade people to believe on the basis of evidence. And at the center of that is the evidence 
for the resurrection or the claim of the resurrection. So that's faith. What about facts? How can we come and explore these evidences and these facts? Is it too strong to start talking about faith and facts together, maybe? Well, you can just read through the Gospels, and you can just ask as you read them, is this historical fact? Does this have a ring of truth to it? You can actually look more broadly at a range of different historical sources. You can look at Paul's letters. You can treat the Gospels themselves as historical documents. You can also look at the book of Acts. You can look at Josephus, a Jewish early historian. You can look at um, Tacitus. And you can lo- look at lots of other Greco and Roman authors and historians who were writing at the time, cataloging what was happening. And you can actually build a case. You can build a certain picture of what Jesus was like, what these events around him were like, what a portrait of his life was like historically from actually looking at these historical sources. And I'm going to try to present to you a collection of five early facts about Jesus, what we might call the minimal facts or the most basic facts that even the most skeptical, the vast majority of the most skeptical scholars on the New Testament and in historical studies in this area would absolutely acknowledge and would say, yes, okay, fair, that's right. We've got to acknowledge these facts. And these are based around principles. We take these facts seriously, not simply because they're, in, not because they're in the Bible or because the Bible claims to be the word of God, but because of real historical principles like multiple attestation, like it, their earliness, how close they were to the events that took place, the criterion of embarrassment, how, how much the writing of those stories perhaps embarrasses the person who's writing those stories. You would then say, well, why would they write that unless they really believed it was true? The idea of how, what the proximity is to those, from the events and from the eyewitnesses to the historical record of them, the, 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 the proximity of the eyewitness testimony, in other words, and the general plausibility of the sources themselves. And so the five Minimal facts or basic facts that I want to present and that Max and I are going to talk about and are very willing to offer and to try to answer questions on are these five facts. First of all, the crucifixion. Second of all, the empty tomb. Third, the appearances of Jesus. And then fourthly, the conversion of skeptics like Paul and James. And also the fifth fact is that with no prior expectation of a crucified, there was no... prior expectation at all of a crucified Messiah or or of a resurrection partway through um, Jewish history at this point. So first of all, this first fact of the crucifixion. Jesus' death by crucifixion is one of the most secure facts of ancient history. Virtually no ancient historian or New Testament scholar doubts this fact or claim. It's attested by Paul and all four Gospels, as well as several other non-Christian first and second century authors and historians, Josephus, Tacitus, Mara Bar Serpian, Lucian, and the Jewish Talmud, all record the event of Jesus' death. That's the first historical fact that we have to try to work out, okay, where does that fit in the way we see things? The second is the fact of the empty tomb, that Jesus' tomb, where he was buried after he was killed on the cross, that his tomb was actually found to be empty. His burial in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea, who was a member of the Jewish council, is attested again by all all four Gospels. It's in all four Gospels. The fact of Jesus' burial is also attested by the early creeds of 1 Corinthians 15, which we think came from a significantly earlier time than the four Gospels, even earlier than those. The early church also had quite strong motives to portray the Jewish leadership negatively, and so it's very unlikely they invited and invented this character of Joseph of Arimathea on the Jewish council, who suddenly was acting nobly towards Jesus. And added to this that women were the first witnesses to the event of the empty tomb. Women were not even allowed to, um, uh, they were so untrusted in culture at that point, their testimony was not valid in a court of law. So to have women as the first witnesses is a very strange detail that you would add if you were inventing this. Their testimony was not trusted, yet this is the basis of some of these early sightings, this, this early sighting of the empty tomb. 
Then thirdly, the fact of the appearances of Jesus. Jesus' followers reported having meetings, apparent encounters with the now risen and resurrected Jesus. All four Gospels point to this. And in the early creed of 1 Corinthians 15, again, we find itself um, also mentioning this. And that creed comes from eyewitnesses who were around at the time. There were also appearances to groups of people, to groups and individuals. So we can't just say, well, it's um, psychological. To Mary Magdalene, to Peter, to the, to the 12, and to 500 people at one time. To James, to the apostles, and to Paul himself. Um, more about him in a moment. And many scholars, therefore, believe very firmly in the bodily, that, that many scholars believe uh, that the, the bodily resurrection, the, the belief that the Jesus had bodily resurrected, that couldn't have arisen in a first century Jewish context because it was such a different view, given um, it couldn't have been explained without actually some sort of appearances happening. And so many scholars are willing to, to, to say, yes, actually, it, it does seem very likely that these people at least reported having these appearances of Jesus. Gerd Ludemann, the great skeptical um, New Testament theologian, says this, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. The fourth fact is the conversion of skeptics, like James, the skeptical brother of Jesus, who was converted due to an apparent meeting with the risen Jesus. And then there was also the apostle Paul. Paul, who at that point was called Saul, he was the greatest persecutor of the early church, was himself converted due to an apparent meeting with the now risen Jesus. And multiple sources testify that Paul was a ferocious um, prosecutor of the early church. Even in one example, um, people laying their cloaks down in front of him while somebody is stoned to death for believing in Jesus. And Paul's letters and his books and his writings very clearly communicate his claim that he met the resurrected Jesus, that he had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus on the way to Damascus. And the fifth fact is that there is really... There's no prior expectation of a crucified Messiah or a resurrection pathway through history. Jesus' followers immediately and unanimously started to believe that Jesus had been bodily resurrected. And, and they didn't really carry with them any prior notion from Judaism that this, would, that this would be their expectation, that this is what would happen. So the theologian N.T. Wright, an expert on this period, says this, the resurrection in the, word, in the world of Second Temple Judaism was about the restoration of Israel on the one hand and about the newly embodied life of Yahweh's people on the other. Nobody imagined that any individuals would be raised in advance of the great last day. There are no traditions about a Messiah being raised to life. Most Jews of the period hoped for resurrection. Many Jews of this period hoped for a Messiah, but nobody put those two hopes together until the early Christians did. So we've talked about faith, we've talked about some of the facts, and we've talked about, we're going to talk about whether this fits. So if we take these facts, these five minimal facts of the crucifixion, the empty tomb, the appearances, the conversion of skeptics, the idea of there being no prior expectation of a crucified Messiah or a pathway through history. If we take these five facts together and we try to say, okay, how are we going to make sense of these things? We can't just say they don't exist. How can we look at all the different hypotheses? How can we look at all the different theories, all the different interpretations and work out which one makes the best sense of this? The hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead is the most rational, the most reasonable, and the most logically coherent explanation of those five facts. Now some, like for example, some people have tried to claim that Jesus merely swooned, that he didn't really die on the cross. But that just seems like a failure to understand the nature of crucifixion, the actual reports about what the Romans did to check that somebody was dead, and the facts surrounding the burial and resurrection appearances. We've got to do better with our explanations if we want to try to avoid the hypothesis, the extraordinary hypothesis, the world-changing hypothesis that he, God actually might have raised 
Jesus from the dead? So that's the question, um, did it happen? And that's for you, maybe the, the first um, step on a journey in exploring some of these things. And even if you can't remember everything that I said, the very least you can take away from this is that actually there are some good facts. They, they do have some things to say here that I can engage with and I can ask more about these things. I'd love to read more about that. I'd love to find out more about that. The second question I'm going to speak to is what does it mean? What does it actually mean? And the next thing I want to briefly look at, on, as well as looking at the, the truth of it, the truth of the claim of the resurrection, is what's the implication of it? What's the effect of it? How does it change anything? Well, if you've ever read any philosophy, and you've ever been unfortunate enough to have to read philosophy by a guy called Immanuel Kant, you'll know he's very hard going in terms of philosophy, but he, Kant asks three amazing questions. In his critique of pure reason, Kant asks these three questions. He says, all of my interests combine into the following three questions. What can I know? What should I do? And what can I hope for? I don't think these are religious questions. I don't think these are Christian questions. I think these are human questions. And I think they strike very deep at the heart of our lives. I think these questions, what can I know? What should I do? And what may I hope for? Are some of the deepest questions that a human being can possibly ask. For example, what can I know? We live in a world where we don't know who to trust. From fake news on one side to um, people um, spinning things on the other side of things to people covering up because of vested interests. Do we trust fake news? Do we, do we, do we, do we trust WikiLeaks? Where, where can we turn to to understand what's going on in our contemporary world? We live at an extraordinary time of power play and upheaval, yet we don't really know how to read the world, how to see, how to understand what is happening. That's the great need of our day in this moment, to see how things really are, to call it how it really is, and to come up with solutions that actually engage with not where people pretend it is, but where things actually are. If we could only know or see how things are, we would move forwards in a huge way. The second question Kant asks is deeply profound. What should we do? The area of morality, the area of right and wrong. I'm in a mess and some of you might be in a mess too. Looking at the news, I was just talking to a friend of mine this morning who's an actor about what he's seen on the casting couch, what he's been asked to do, what he's experienced, what he's seen in the industry. We've seen this wave of revelations about sexual harassment that have been occurring that's come on the back of another wave of revelations about child abuse scandals in our world. I was talking to somebody who runs an institute in New York and in Washington which tries to stop child trafficking and tries to stop people trafficking. He says, actually, are we really making an impact? Maybe only through enforcement. The number of people being trafficked and enslaved labor has never been higher. What is wrong with us? Why are we doing this to each other in our world? The wealth inequalities, as well as we, the, the extraordinary fact that we have enough food to feed everybody, yet there are still people who go to bed starving tonight. How can that be right in our world? We can only... In the end, look to ourselves and say, what, what choices are we making? What, how are we perpetuating and continuing the same thing? I hope that you will use some of your great and marvelous gifts that you've been given in your life to deal with some of those and to attack some of those issues as best as you can. But the truth is that actually the problem isn't just out there. There's a problem in here. It's not just that we need to know reality. It's not just that we need to see the world out there. We also need to see ourselves. And when we look at ourselves in the cold light of day, we actually see that the moral challenge isn't just out there. It's also in here. There are things I do I'm not proud of. There are things you do in your life that you may not be proud of, that you may um, find come back to your conscience and you just say, I wish I didn't do that. I wish I didn't say that. I wish I didn't think like that. And then there are questions, the third question that Kant asks is the question, what may I hope for? What may I hope for? This may not seem like it's immediately relevant, but let me point out to you something. You're going to die. I'm going to die. 
The greatest fact about any of our lives in many ways is that every single person in this room will die. Some psychologists and thinkers have said that much of what human beings do is motivated by our fear of death. Kierkegaard says maybe we make so much noise on New Year's Eve to cover up the sound of the grass growing over our graves. That's Kierkegaard. (laughs) There is a reality to our universe and to ourselves. We know that physicists tell us that the universe is doomed to destruction. All the energy will be so spread out that we, the universe goes through what's called heat death. There will not be enough collected energy necessarily in any one place for anybody to survive, even in a robot body. What is our hope, really? I've just watched a, a friend of mine dying from stage 4 cancer in his mid-30s with a, a young child. What is the hope, really? Another friend of mine has had a terrible diagnosis in the last couple of weeks. We might feel like we're going to live forever when we're young, but the reality is is that we're aging, and our world is winding down too. The question of hope is not just a question of what am I going to get out of bed for today. It's a bigger question, a human question, a question that has cosmic significance. Is this all there is? Is there something more? Now, to these three questions, what may I know? What should I do? What about that moral challenge, the moral renewal that we need as human beings? And what may I hope for? The cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection speak in the most powerful way. I only have a few moments to talk to you about this. Maybe um, I could just read you very briefly from um, the book of Acts where Paul links together these themes and he shows how the cross speaks to these themes. I'm going to read from the book of Acts where Paul stands up to address, address the high court in Athens. I was just there, actually not in the high court, but actually in the place where um, he would have stood up to address the Oropagus Council. He says this to them. Men of Athens, I see that in every way you were very religious. For as I walked around and I looked carefully at your objects of worship, I found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now what you worship is something unknown. I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven. What can I know? Paul is telling us that God is showing himself. And he does not live in temples built by hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And therefore, since we are God's offspring, We should not think that we are that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God has overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he's given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, "We want to hear you again on this subject." And then Paul left the council. A few people became followers and believed. And among them was Dionysus, a member of the Oropagus, and a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Three responses to what he'd said. He tied the resurrection, God showing himself in the person of Christ. He tied this into God showing himself, God revealing what he's like in the person of Christ. The Bible talks about how in the fullness of The fullness of God is revealed in the person of Christ. We always expect a hero to come in strength. Every single one of our movies has a hero who's strong. The hero that really can rescue us and the hero who really shows us what God is like actually comes in the weakness of a baby in a stable. We'll sing about it in a couple of months' time. And this hero comes, he slips under the radar, and in his weakness... He gives such a hope that nobody has ever dared to offer such a hope. He says he actually will rise from the dead, and then he goes and he does it. He leaves a group of his followers and friends to report what has happened and to take that message out to the world. To Kant's questions, what can I know? What should I do? What can I hope for? 
Jesus brings us the revelation of God, telling us what we can know, showing us what God is like in his person and in his word. He gives us the hope of moral renewal and change to what should we do. He can change us from the inside out through his work on the cross. God takes what's wrong with us and he opens up a way for us to have a living friendship with God. He becomes our friend. He begins to transform us. That's what you'll begin to discover if you dare to read that book on the table in front of you. And Kant's third question, what may I hope for? Jesus is the only person who has provided rational reasonable grounds for this claim. That's why, when I was a first year at university, studying philosophy, I decided that I would put my trust in him. Okay, my third question, the third stage that I want to give to you now, for you to talk about on your tables, for you to begin to chat about, just to get your conversations going, is the question, how should somebody respond to this? How should a reasonable person respond to all of this? How should you respond right now? It might be a different response for you, Um, than somebody else on the table. But how should you personally respond? Maybe it's a question. Maybe it's something you need to go and ask. Maybe it's to look at the ceiling tonight and say, God, are you there? Show yourself to me as I read this. Show yourself to me. If you show yourself to me, I will follow you because I'm open to truth. Thank you.